You know, it's been a while since I covered an anime on the channel. In fact, it was all the way back in April, where I took three months to look at the science behind the anime cells at work, to see what kind of immunology could be learned from that slice of cell life. It's time for another viewer requested episode, so let's return to this world of hair so sharp it could take someone's eye out, as we take a look at one of the world's most popular anime. Hello everybody, and welcome to the Science of where today we're taking a look at the world of quirks found in My Hero Academia. But before we begin today's video, I'd just like to say that if you enjoy it, then make sure you leave a like, subscribe and click the bell to keep up to date on the science of, and to see more of the real world science involved in your favourite games, shows and more. My Hero Academia, or Buckle No Hero Academia, is a superhero manga created by Kohei Horikoshi, with the first volume being released all the way back in 2014. The story of My Hero Academia takes place in a world where people are born with superpowers or meta abilities called quirks. These are genetic abilities that can be passed down and mixed through genetic recombination and can result in abilities ranging from explosive sweat to having elbows that are glorified tape dispensers. Now you'd think that given this is a genetic construct that everyone in this world would have a quirk. But thanks to good old genetic mutations, there is a small selection of the population that doesn't have any quirk at all, as well as an extra joint in their pinky toe for some reason. In any case, today we're taking a look at a pretty simple quirk. No sticky balls of hair or anti-gravity powers here. We're looking at someone who can gain significant muscle mass in an instant, using the quirk One For All. Unlike other quirks in the series, One For All is transferable, and it allows its owner to enhance their physical abilities. It's worth noting though that its method of transfer requires the recipient of One For All to ingest a sample of their predecessor's DNA, with the main example in the show being a strand of hair. But as you might remember from previous videos, hair itself does not actually contain any DNA. Hair is just formed of a substance called keratin, a fibrous helicoidal protein that's synthesised by keratinocytes. The only DNA present in hair is actually taken from the hair bulb or follicle where the hair protein grows out of. But enough of the logistics of inheriting one for all, how about the quirk itself? Well, to answer this, we need to take a look at one of one for all's hosts. But instead of looking at Izuku Midoriya, the current host of one for all, we're going to be looking back one generation to look at its previous host, Toshinori Yagi, otherwise known as All Might. The reason for this is very simple. Compare Midoriya's build before and after using One For All, and there's very little difference in his muscle tone and growth. Compare this to All Might's muscle growth, which is much more significant, making Toshinori unrecognisable as the hero All Might. So, in order to understand One For All, we need to understand the physiology and some of the biochemistry involved in muscle growth. This means taking a quick refresher on what muscles actually are, specifically skeletal muscle, which is what would be impacted most by One For All. These come in a variety of shapes and sizes, and are made up of a wide variety of cells. Skeletal muscles contain cylindrical muscle cells called muscle fibres, and in each muscle there could be hundreds or even thousands of these muscle fibres bundled together. These are formed up of fibrils and microfibrils that consist of thin actin and thick myosin filaments, surrounded by a sarcoplasmic reticulum. These muscle fibres are coated in a layer of tissue called the endomesium, and bundles of these muscle fibres are wrapped together in a covering of connective tissue called a fasciliculus, which in turn is surrounded by a layer of tissue called a paramecium, and finally this is all surrounded by a final layer of connective tissue called the endomesium. These connective tissues, the epimesium, paramecium and endomesium, extend from the main body of the muscle to form thick tendons or flat sheets like aponeurosis. They act as support tissues, allowing the muscle to withstand the forces of contraction, as well as providing pathways for the passage of blood and nerves throughout the muscle. Skeletal muscles have an abundance of blood vessels, owing to their main function being contraction. In order for muscle fibres to contract, it needs to receive an impulse from a nerve cell, and each nerve cell are accompanied by both an artery and a vein, as they penetrate the epimesium layer. Ok, so now we know how muscles are organised, let's see how they grow to the point of looking just like all mites. Muscle growth can occur in three ways, an increase in muscle cell numbers, an increase in the diameter of muscle fibres, and an increase in the length of muscle fibres. All three of these mechanisms are involved in cell growth, however, growth in cell numbers is limited by prenatal and postnatal periods, 
In other words, once you're born, you're going to have a full set of muscle cells, and after that the number of muscle cells won't increase. So this leaves us with two mechanisms. We need to increase the diameter or the length of the muscle fibres. When we go down to the molecular level, we find this whole process to be pretty complex, featuring a wide variety of regulators that promote both positive and negative changes in skeletal muscle mass. One regulatory pathway involved in promoting skeletal muscle mass is the PI3K AKT MTOR pathway. This regulatory pathway is central to hypertrophy or the gain of muscle and involves three main components. Phosphatidylinosyntol 4 5 biphosphate free kinase or PI3K, a serine threonine protein kinase B, confusingly called AKT, and mammalian targeter of rapamycin, otherwise known as MTOR. When you engage in exercise, your body will experience muscle tension or metabolic stress. These will result in damage to muscle cells. This results in the body having to repair or replace damaged muscle fibres once at rest. This is done through a process where muscle fibres fuse together to form new protein strands or microfibrils. These repaired fibrils will have a greater thickness and result in muscle growth. But what if you want to add muscle to your muscle cells? Well, this is where something called satellite cells come in. Satellite cells, or myosatellites, are small multipotent cells with very little cytoplasm found in mature muscles. These cells are precursors to skeletal muscle cells and are like stem cells for your muscles, able to add more nuclei to muscle cells and contribute to the growth of myofibrils. This all occurs when the rate of protein synthesis is greater than the rate of protein breakdown. In order to increase the rate of protein synthesis, the PI3K AKT MTOR pathway needs to be activated by members of a non-receptor tyrosine kinase family. In this pathway, PI3K activates AKT by either receptor binding or by integrin mediated activation of the focal adhesion kinase. Once activated, AKT has the ability to phosphorylate and change the activity of many signaling molecules such as down regulators of AKT, MTOR and glycogen synthase 3 beta. This PI3K AKT signaling pathway then goes on to dominantly inhibit the effects of a secreted protein called myostatin, which is a member of the GGF beta family of proteins. The inhibition or deletion of this protein causes an increase in protein size as myostatin acts both to inhibit myoblast differentiation and to block the AKT pathway. In other words, by blocking the myostatin, the PI3K AKT activation stimulates differentiation and protein synthesis. Following AKT activation, the AKT goes on to activate MTOR via direct phosphorylation. Once activated, the MTOR then goes on to activate a protein called P70S6K, and this is a key regulator for protein translation through the phosphorylation of 40S ribosomal protein S6. This leads to ribosomes translating messenger RNA and linking groups of amino acids together to form new amino acid chains, which then fold to become quaternary structure proteins. But AKT isn't only involved in the development of additional proteins. It's also involved in a negative regulation of protein degradation by inhibiting fork head box or FOXO, which are then excluded from the cell's nucleus and the upregulation of MURF1 and MAFBX is blocked. Both of these mediate protein atrophy or degradation by ubiquinating protein substrates, causing proteins to undergo degradation by proteasomes. Proteasomes are protein complexes that degrade unneeded or damaged proteins by a process called proteolysis, a chemical reaction that breaks down peptide bonds. Now all of that was a lot to take on, so in summary, exercise damages your cells, and in response the body increases protein synthesis to repair or replace damaged muscle fibres. A growth factor will bind to the surface of a muscle cell using a tyrosine kinase receptor. This will activate PI3K, which in turn activates AKT. This AKT downregulates FOXO mediated proteasome activity to stop unneeded proteins from being broken down. At the same time, phosphorylating MTOR, which in turn phosphorylates S6 ribosomal proteins, leading to protein translation and increased protein synthesis. So what we can assume from this is that all for one is causing a considerable increase in protein synthesis and that's what's causing the increase in muscle growth. But it goes without saying that some aspects of this transformation are unlikely to be down to this pathway, such as the changes that occur to his hair. 
That kind of transformation could only be achieved with genetic changes and a lot of hair gel. But when it comes to the rate that you can gain muscle in My Hero Academia, what's shown is unsurprisingly unrealistic, with All Might being able to gain hundreds of pounds of muscle mass over the course of a second. Now, there aren't really that many studies into the issues with gaining muscle mass too quickly. There are a lot talking about gaining fat mass, but they're not exactly comparable. However, many studies have looked into the impact that muscle bulking supplements such as steroids have upon the human body. But given that all for one is a naturally occurring process, side effects such as the hardening of arteries or elevated cholesterol levels are unlikely. It is possible that other side effects such as high blood pressure and heart palpitations could result from such a drastic increase in muscle mass, as the heart would need to work much harder than it was before in order to get the blood supply to all the body's new musculature. And seeing as the muscle found in the heart is its own category compared to the skeletal muscle and smooth muscle tissue, we cannot be sure that All Might's heart would become stronger alongside all of his other muscles. So there we go. One for All is definitely interesting as far as superpowers go, and although it's incredibly unrealistic, there are a lot of factors that make it more interesting than your average super strength, from the method that it's transferred to the overall transformation. But it's worth noting that this isn't the only quirk with a lot of interesting scientific aspects to it. Emitter quirks such as Kaminari's ability to produce electricity or Bakugo's ability to produce explosive sweat are both great candidates for science of videos, as is the quirk called Cell Activation as seen in My Hero Academia Heroes Rising. So you can definitely expect me to cover some of the science behind these quirks later down the line. There are a lot to cover, and for some of the smaller ones, such as Fat Gum's fat absorption ability, I might just do a few mini sign subs here and there. As always, if you enjoyed this video, then don't forget to leave a like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. And if you want to help combat the ever changing and frustrating YouTube algorithm, then make sure you share the video to help my channel grow. If you have any particular scientific subject or topic that you'd like to see me cover in the future, then please tell me in the comments down below. As well as that, follow me on Twitter to get the latest updates on science of videos and join my Discord for chats about science, gaming and more. But until then, this has been the Science of My Hero Academia. I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you're looking for game based content then you can join me over on Twitch, where I livestream 3 times a week playing all manner of games suggested by the community. Or if you want to support the channel even further, then you could contribute to my Patreon where you'll get behind the scenes access to the creation of all videos, as well as being able to vote on what the next signs of video will be.